A very good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today at the CGS CMB Thoughts Leadership Webinar. We are honored to have with us today Inchek Malik Ali, the founder of BFM 89.9, Mr. Kusu Chuang, our forever beloved moderator, Wan Ruzi Ajit, my C Chief Executive Officer of CGS CIMB Securities Malaysia. And we'll start the afternoon with an opening remark by our CEO, then followed by a conversation between Inchek Malik and also Chuang. And as usual, housekeeping rule is that if there's any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat box or the Q&A box. Alternatively, if you are joining us from Facebook, you can also send the questions there and we'll pick it up and pass it over to the moderator. So let me not hold up the event and let's get it started. Over to you, Ruzi. Thank you, Chimei. Uh, Walt Disney once said, all dreams can come true if you only have the courage to pursue. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our ninth CJSCMB Thoughts Leadership Series. Thoughts is a social impact platform for prominent individuals to share their wealth of experience to inspire young, up and coming and um, up and coming talent. From our previous discussion of School of Hard Knocks to leading startups and scale ups, we continue our spirit of entrepreneurship and innovation in today's topic of turning ideas into reality with none other than Malik Ali, founder of BFM 89.9 and FI Life. For those who may not know, Malik is an icon within the media industry. Within 18 months of its inception since 2008, Malik trailblazed um, BFM to successfully break into the traditional radio media industry. And thanks to his innovation and creativity, we all get to enjoy the hip, fresh and sensational radio content we have today. Who better to bring out the best of Malik other than our favorite BFM moderator, Chuang. We hope you will all enjoy this exciting and inspiration, inspire, inspiring session. Without taking more time, I will now pass the floor to Malik and Chuang to kick off the session. Over to you, Chuang. Thanks, Ruzi, and thanks, Chiming. Welcome to everybody. And uh, I think we're going to have a very nice session. Malik and I go back a long way, over 10 years, and time flies when you're having fun. In fact, um, there's a lot of inspirational stories that Malik can share, but let's start at the start, right? And I think we've had this discussion many times before, Malik, about how and what made you into what you are, you know, with all your colors and your stripes and how interesting you are. Maybe with the parents, I guess, because that's how all of us start, right? Maybe in terms of the family life, how did that shape you and make you what you are today? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, it's a very complex family. Um, um, I mean, basically, it's almost like exponential in nature. My father married thrice. My mother married twice. And uh, so, um, so I think it's it's been a bit of like you know a bit of broken home, a bit of like you know sort of thing. But net net, what happened was I, I was a very lonely child. Um, I had much older brothers and sisters from first marriage. Uh, I lived with my father and my stepmother. Is um, you know, and um, so it was a very kind of like. And the rest of my brothers were at least uh, you know sort of ten years ahead of me in terms of age, right? Um, uh, so because of that, I was kind of like the only kid in the house uh, with my stepmother. And uh, and bored, bored like hell. <laughs> so so yeah, I, I I that's the time I started just you know. And those days we didn't have like you know we didn't have mobile phones, we didn't have even we didn't have color TVs, right? And TVs only started at five p.m. Radio only started at two p.m. Um, so there wasn't much to entertain myself other than a a ball and books. And um and so the rest of the time I I dreamt, right? I just started dreaming about things, you know, just kind of like you know dreaming about doing other things and so on. So I think that was um my childhood was very much uh, uh, quite a lonely one, a bit of a dreamy one, uh, surrounded by books and a ball. <laughs> it's interesting, Malik, because when you look at um, some of the lives and backgrounds of celebrities and, and the, the best-known artists, best-known film directors, they, for the most part, come from troubled, challenged um, backgrounds. And that's what sparks their creativity. I think Miley Cyrus talked about it once before. But it's interesting because I'm sure there's a sociological angle to this. Um, which part of KL were you, well, which part of Malaysia were you from? Um, and did that, uh, I, I, you know, how did that play into the background of who you are? Yeah, sorry, I lost you for a second. Um, yes. I was about to get back up. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. I lost you for about 30 seconds. Can yeah, you okay. So, yeah, yeah. So I, I guess m maybe what part of Malaysia were you born? Um, you know, did you, were you closest to your dad in those days? Um, you know, what, what kind of books did you read? What kind of things do you watch on television? 
Yeah. So um, was born in KL. Um, very much in the comp- um, uh, born in KL. I was actually in Asuta Hospital, and then I I was my first five years of my life I spent it in uh, near Jalan Kampong Atap area in a, one of the first few apartments there. I used to remember. I used to think that the you know and I, basically it's next to the um, Medeka Stadium. So I used to hear all the Quranic competitions and all the events on the medical competition. I used to think that the voice over the speakers was the voice of God, right? <laughs> That's especially during Quranic competition time. Um, so yeah, so I had a very, so quite a, again, very, uh, low, because my father had two wives at a time. So he only spent one night with me and then and then basically spent you know, another night somewhere else. And so I had a very, um, looking back, it's a little bit of a traumatic first five years, right? Because you kind of like, you, you love seeing your dad and then your dad disappears, right? And, um, and but my mom was, you know, the, the, my, my mom was there, of course, but she was, she was nagging me day and night. So I'm like, ah, so, so basically the first five years were very, again, quite lonely, um, was the only child. And then I moved up and then my parents split up. So I, I moved with my father and, and the stepmother. And then there's some adjustment there. But I must say, it's not, it wasn't a bad childhood. It was a, it was a, it was a, it's actually quite a comfortable childhood. It was just lonely, that's all. Um, so, but, and because of that, I guess um, that's where, you know, sort of um, the, you know, the, the need to uh, occupy oneself, the need to, you know, read, the need to learn about other things, uh, you know, read, read, you know, uh, read the encyclopedias, read the, you know, read the Enid Blyton books, all that kind of thing, and and built up in pretty much a, a, a fantastical imagination, right? Uh, because of the, all these books, the imagining what a, what you know um, a boarding house looks like imagine, imagine what a boarding school looks like you know through books and um, so I think that was I guess that was a cre- maybe that 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 uh, that started that creative side of like always thinking about you know fantastical or as a, 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 like for example the theme of this right is ideas uh, they're not necessarily reality yet but they are ideas and and so on right what if what if all the time I'm going what if this was like this what if was I would like what what if I had some friends right kind of thing so yeah Okay, it's interesting. Can't make sure. I can't make decide whether you're an introverted extrovert or an extroverted introvert. Um, but you know, I've always known you as a diehard entrepreneur, right? And the thing is, it's interesting because unlike a lot of um, you know your typical businessman, right? You're not you're not intrigued by money. You're not intrigued by the trappings of wealth per se. You don't. I don't think you even own a car, Malay, like in Malaysia. Right? I think your your car was a. It's a 30-year-old car. It was a, it was a, it was a jalopy, right? It was terrible. Couldn't even start, I think. Um, you don't own fancy watches. You don't like fancy wine. I think you think 10 times before you buy an iPhone. Um, but the thing is, you, you want to start a business. You, 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 you would like to put ideas into practice. And that's the intriguing thing about you. What makes you that person? Um, I, I don't know. I think it's just, um, you know, I, I guess business is there to, you know, uh, we create business not just for a personal gain. I, I somehow uh, rail against that. Actually, you create business to create value for, for people around you, right? Um, for customers and people around you. You, you must give something of value uh, and not just make, you know, just, just so that you can, you know, expropriate the profit for yourself. I, 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 that's why I, know I had a private equity guy coming up to my ex boss, Nick Bloy, who is the, um, um, who is the kind of founder of, um, uh, of you know um, uh, of Navis Capital, and uh, and remember he, he looked at me and he said Malik it's really weird. I mean I would like I I, I do love you know I, I, we work together and I do like to invest in some of the things that you're doing, but you're more of a social entrepreneur than anything else, right? Profit you you never you never think of profits as the main goal, and that's that's why I find it hard to invest in you and in your companies because you have this other dimension. And I think some some investors have to get, have to get used to that when they join me on certain ventures. Um, I you know it basically is not all it's not it's not sort of full on you know uh, um, you know get get profits at all costs. It's basically can we build a business and make money along the way, right? It's it's, it's in that order. Build business that of, is of value to someone to some a community and so on, and then make money along the way, right? I think that's the emphasis is there. Maybe it's because, you know, to be honest, I haven't, I didn't have a tough childhood, right? I mean, I didn't have a tough childhood financially. Um, I was uh, very much middle class. Um, and, there, and you know, I, I, I didn't, you know, I did not have challenges. The challenges only came later in life, but my childhood was not, so, so, so there was never that, um, sadly or not sadly, there was never that hunger for, for you know, uh, making ends meet until later in life. But 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 in childhood, no, there, there wasn't that issue at all. Do you think there's something to be read into there, Malik? Because you know, sometimes when you listen to the stories of your typical huge businessman like a Liu Kisin, for example, they've come from very tough backgrounds. 
and you know that prompts them to make these huge fortunes and to keep on making more and more and more money. The fact that you come from a middle class background, um, and the fact that you built a, a series of social enterprises where I can see there's a lot of similarities between what you're trying to do and what I think China is trying to move into, where you know you don't have you don't encourage that divide between the ones that are really made at the top and the ones that are being left behind at the bottom. You, you're trying to build a business where everybody profits and everybody benefits from it in some way, shape or form. Um, do you think there's going to be a template for entrepreneurialism in the future? I think that we're all different types. And um, so, yeah, I, I completely buy into people who have had a tough, uh, finan- a tough financial childhood, right? And then making it big and, you know, and going for it and, you know, and, and that's fine. That's completely okay, right? Um, but there are also other types of entrepreneurs. I mean, there are other entrepreneurs that are not even like me that like who, you know, really do things which are really even not sustainable, but they're doing it. They're coming up with their own money of their own pockets or raising it into causes which are not even paying for themselves, right? So they're, they're, all of us come in different stripes. Um, all of us, you know, there's a myriad of backgrounds, myriad of, of, of motiv- motivations. And I guess... Um, you know, everyone to his own, but all I ask for, even from the big guys, even from the tycoons is, yeah, do give something back, right? Do, do bring along the people that you, you, um, that, that work for you, do bring along people that, um, you know, that make the business happen, right? So, you know, I think that's, that's important to me because, you know, it's, it's not, you know, you and your progeny and your, 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 your family did not make the business happen. You made it happen with a team. And I think that team uh, deserves some of the pie. Um, um, you know, uh, and, and a, a pretty, I wish I would say a pretty important piece of the pie, right? So not just leave it for owners of capital, as many of uh, the audience here is um, are um, owners of you, you, owners of financial capital have had it good for the last 30, 40 years, um, but we need to own, own you know, the own, We only also need to help you know, the owners of labor capital, right? Uh, owners of labor, you know, the heart, you know, blood, sweat, and tears of your team. I think that's important. Uh, we need to recognize that. I think a lot of people don't realize, Malay. Like, yeah, we need to redress that. We really need to redress that. I really believe that. I, I came from Harvard Business School, and um, I can tell you, seventy percent of us graduated as owners of financial capital, right, or, or managers of financial capital, right. And yeah, we did, they lead comfortable lives, really, really comfortable lives, right. Whether you know, and CGSIMB, right. Whether you, whether your your portfolio goes up twenty percent in one year, goes down twenty percent in one year, you still get your carry, right. You still get your one percent, but. You know that doesn't work for most. That doesn't work for you know uh, for workers. You get fired. You know you don't get your you don't get your salary, right? So you know owners of financial capital or managers of financial capital get it best both ways. And that's and we so therefore if you are you're given that privileged position, I think we really need to sort of you know uh, give uh, give recognition to those who you know really to the literally to their to to their sweat and labor doing doing stuff for you, making those companies that we invest in as owners of financial capital. So I think there needs to be this redress, um, you know, between you know between these two between these two groups for sure. Yeah. So I think uh, owners of financial capital mean you own shares, stocks, bonds, real estate, um, other intellectual property assets, which which throw income off for you on, on an annual basis, recurring basis, and of course, which also grows in value as time goes by. A lot of people don't have that financial capital, Malik. Yeah. And I yeah. And 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 I want to talk about how you not you are not um, straight into entrepreneurialism. You did go the tried and tried tested route initially. Um, you went to school. You went to university, you studied law at Bristol, then you came out and then you went and did your master's at Harvard. Then you became a corporate guy, right? I think you've spent time in Yahoo, you had time in uh, Job Street, you had type, time in McKinsey. Um, and then you jumped into entrepreneurialism. What were the lessons that you learned in, in those uh, years? Um, I, I think it wasn't really a big corporate gig. Um, the only corporates I worked for, I wouldn't put you know, the, you know, the Boston Consulting Groups and all that as corporates. Um, they're more consulting firm, services companies and all that. But the corporates I'm talking about, people like, um, not even Yahoo for that matter, because Yahoo was still like the Google of the day, right? Um, um, and I think the only corporates I worked for really is uh, I think Maxis uh, for one. Um, and that's pretty much it really. Um, but I guess one thing that I, I do realize is that um, uh, one thing that tires me a little in corporate is that sometimes you're not working for uh, the, in the best interest of the company. Sometimes we're working in best interest of people's careers, right? So when you are doing, when your boss gives you a good grade, it's not because you're doing good, great, good work for the for the organization. You're doing good work for him or her, 
right? Um, so, and, and sometimes I, I, I find that because sometimes, you know, we are doing, and, and I realize in, in corporate organizations, I, I see this as, as, a, as a consultant, as well as someone who's, who was it actually, you know, you try to do the best in the interest of the company. Uh, but sometimes what happens is that, you know, um, it, the, um, you know, the, 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 your efforts are like, you know, no, 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 because the best of your company does not equal the best in interest of the manager that you work for. So sometimes I feel in corporate environments, you're actually working for uh, people's careers, other people's careers, <laughs> in addition to your own. And I find that very, very um, demotivating sometimes, right? Because I really want to work for an organization that really uh, sort of, um, you know, sort of works in the best interest of everyone at the organization, right? Um, you know, so uh, give you an example, Yahoo, right? Um, I was at Yahoo and, you know, there's Google on the horizon and, you know, and there were some resources that we had to, you know, uh, I was at the Southeast Asia office based in Singapore and I went to a regional thing and the, my, my goal, the objective of the regional conference was to where best to put the next, the next $100 million, right? Uh, which project to put it in. And I went there and I, I had the projects that we had from Southeast Asia met the Korean guys, met the Japanese guys, all there. We were in the same room. And at that meeting, I realized what we were doing in Singapore was, was should, should be completely downgraded compared to what the Koreans were going to do, right? The Koreans were going to build the next Android, right? And, and so I didn't fight for those resources. I just said, you know what? Fantastic Korea. You've done, a, you know, you've sold me. I, I don't even need to present my case because, you know, you are the one that's going to save this company and fight against Google. Um, but, you know, guess what? When I came back to Singapore, I got blasted for it, right? And you're like, you know, it became like, why didn't you get us resources? Because I said, Korea deserved it more. But you didn't even fight for it. Yeah, because they, they had a better product, right? Um, so, so everyone in my Singapore office was like very upset and so on, but because they were thinking of their own careers, their own PNL and their sort of thing, but they weren't thinking of the Yahoo career, the, the, the Yahoo PNL, the Yahoo Inc. PNL. So that's why I got a little bit disillusioned in that, those kind of environments where people are actually just thinking of their turf, their... Uh, their areas, um, the resources for their own thing, whereas they're not looking at the big picture as to what will make Yahoo great again. And guess what? Yeah, so you know, Google came out with Android, and boom, Bob's your uncle. They, they, you know, they took it and they, they, they ran with it, right? So there we are. And look where Yahoo is now. Well, exactly. I mean, Yahoo is worth what twenty billion now, and uh, Alphabet, which is worth uh, what one point five trillion US dollars. I think the key difference is that Yahoo didn't really have a cause, whereas Google appeared to have a cause. They wanted to change the world. They wanted to change it for the better. And I think in in that respect, people who worked at Google felt that they were there for a universal um, advantage and a, or a benefit. So, if you are starting a business, right, or you're trying to run a business, how do you inject that? Um, the commonality into your people? How do you make them work for the organization, not for themselves necessarily? It's a struggle. It's a real struggle. And I, 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 I find that you know, in any organization, or even my own organizations, right? Um, um, even BFM. I mean, you know, trying, trying to, for example, work, make you work for the organization is tough, right? Um, you're, you're, you're like, no, I'm, I'm working for Kusu Chuang. Right? I'm not working for organization. But somehow we find a happy medium somewhere along the way, right? So Yok Chuang. I, I will rent your time, right, to do this particular things. Don't worry, you have, you know, I know you're working for yourself and so on. So I think this is the kind of thing that happens all the time. I think, you know, having um, not too many layers of management uh, really helps. And at, at BFM, we only have maximum uh, two layers of management, right? Um, you know, three actually, me and then team leaders. I, I think that's a general manager and team leaders, that's it. Um, so, so. I guess that's one way um, um, to do that, but I think it's, it, I'm not saying it's easy. It's not, it's always, you know, and, and building that tr trust is, um, yes, you can build trust with that. You know, I, I built trust with you and so on, but I haven't built trust with, you know, the, the last 10 recruits of BFM, right? Um, they, you know, that, that you happens vicariously. You, you hope that, you know, um, Mira, Mira builds trust, trust with them. You hope that their team leaders build trust with them, right? So, but I don't, I, I don't do that personally anymore. So I think it's, uh, it's always a challenge and it's always something that you can't just leave to chance and you always have to like oversee um, just to make sure that, you know, hey, let, we're doing this. What, what's the purpose of doing this? And in BFM, we say building first world Malaysians. We're doing this because we want to build Malaysia and Malaysians, right? Uh, we, want, we want first world Malaysians in all the respects, not, not in economic respects, but also in social respects, right? So, so there we go. Yeah, so if, if you're talking to an entrepreneur, right, when you do talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, you fund them and you advise them on a regular basis, Malik, what do you tell them in terms of the raison d'etre, the reason for existence? Um, I think it, 
they need to, you know, they need, need really need, need to believe that they're solving something, right? Now, of value, that, that it's of value to someone, right? Um, so um, we, um, I invest in Kakitangan, BFM Capital. We have a, a, venture, a small seed capital arm, Ben's Kakitangan. You know, I need FN to believe that, you know, that his his product is solving problems for for corporate clients, right? And of sort of yeah, and and he is solving them. Um, we we also invested in Newswave and um, Sui uh, Singh. He you know I I I need to find out whether he believes in sort of disseminating uh, news information, right? Um, through uh, being an aggregator of news and disseminating it, um, you know. So you need to have that first that fundamental uh, belief and passion, and then you know and then the money will come. Of course, you you want people who are hungry for sales. You want people who are hungry for. I think I actually sometimes I, I I wonder whether I will recruit myself as an I would invest myself as an entrepreneur. I, I actually and the honest answer is if I was you know Malik you my advice to myself Malik you need to be a bit more uh, you need to be a bit more kanchong about sales you know <laughs> that's what I would say to myself right you're just too too relaxed right um, so but 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 that that there we are right so so I think I expect that of other entrepreneurs I expect them to have a fundamental belief in that solving a solution or having you know they have a real problem to solve. And then, and then, and and money will be part of it, but not the not the complete story. Well, I mean, Malaysia is now Malaysia is a very different country to Singapore, and Singapore is where we're talking to you right now. You know, in yeah. in Singapore, things things work efficiently. Uh, the toilets are clean, uh, the people are well dressed, and everybody speaks English. It's a it's a first world country, right? And some people okay, say they're the best, English, but that's okay. <laughs> that's true so 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 people might say the best businesses emanate from countries where there's a lot of things wrong with the system right and and businesses solve problems right you might not get the same level of entrepreneurship in singapore that you get in malaysia because there's so many things broken in malaysia so 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 i mean for example if someone says to you hey malay what are the the three biggest problems malaysia has that you can solve with an op- entrepreneurial solution what, what would it be um, I'm not sure whether it can be solved by entrepreneurial solution, but certainly um, the top one for me, and I, I think to me, I just focus on just one, uh, is the educational system, right? Uh, to me, there's a lot of um, private initiatives in it. I think you know, we have a lot of international schools, a lot of private pre-paying schools, but I think for that one, we really need at, at least an entrepreneurial mindset, right? Um, I think um, the... I think our education system is um, we spend a lot of money on it as a percent of GDP. It's not it's not showing in the results, um, and and I think there's there's a lot uh, there's a lot of not invented here syndrome, uh, meaning if it's if it's not the coming something coming out of MOE, it's like uh, or if someone's experimenting with something, you know, good ideas do not get spread. Good ideas do not do not do not get institutionalized. We have Teach for Malaysia has been around for at least ten years, uh, trying to make inroads into and they're doing doing a fantastic job. And I think we just and there's uh, there's um, uh, uh, Yayasan Amir who are doing a fantastic job with you know with the hundred schools that they have, um, and you know can we get some of these ideas in and th- that's an entrepreneurial endeavor uh, within this education system. But can we get this can we get this sort of spirit of entrepreneurship all across the ten thousand schools in Malaysia? And I think that's the one that's the challenge. And you know it's something that if if we can if we can fix and we can do it, um, I think Malaysia will be fine. Uh, it's just getting that on the road right now i think you know there's a lot of noise with politics and so on i'm just like honestly i, I switch off uh these days i'm just focusing on completely on the education part and, and looking at people and resources mainly people who can bring the education system system, system forward oh you're right and the thing is when you look at the educational sector in malaysia Malay, some of the biggest you know success stories you know you know, your health colleges and your KDUs and your Sunway colleges, those, those are relics of the past. They're dinosaurs, right? And some of the new entities that you talked about, the Teach for Malaysians, they don't have that scale of uh, the KDUs and the helps of the, at the past. What do you think they need to do to scale? And, you know, for example, I think the, the key thing is the qualitative element. You need to have a, um, a teaching faculty that are made of the right stuff with the right attitude. I think that could be a real bottleneck. How would you solve that problem? So um, I don't, I don't, Presume to have all the answers, but I think um, you know if if you hang around until I mean if, if the audience on Facebook live right now, uh, tomorrow um, Thursday six p.m. right um, on the BFM uh, BFM um, Facebook page we're having a Facebook live with Idris Jala and Chen Li Li Kai of McKinsey the guys who who uh, you know the, this is genesis of the Malaysia Education Blueprint right. So why repeat? I'm I'm not trying to suggest that I know everything, but what what has been done? There's a start that 
things have been done. People know stuff. People know about our education system. People know, people have done labs on it. And, and they are, the solution has been written down. The solutions have been planned out. Uh, the question is, how do we execute it, right? So I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, what it, it, things have been, we have the Malaysia Education Blueprint, is just to put it into effect, effectively, right? Um, and I think, you know, there's no need, you know, um, it, we, you know, it can be any minister who comes in, et cetera, but if we actually are good implementers, we, we can get this very far. I mean, you know, um, Idris Jalla will point to rural schools that have done much, that do better than urban schools, right? Not because they need more resources, they need more this, you know, it's not, it's not about resources. It's about, it's about the, 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 the ingenuity and the efforts of the principal in that particular school the resourcefulness, right? And I think, um, I think we can. I think there are there are non you know, sort of expensive solutions out there, but it has to. The emphasis is really on the soft side. It's not the hardware. It's on the people. It's on the teachers. It's on the principals. Well, any new disruptive industry goes through a state of flux, and there's a lot of attrition in the meantime. And of course, when you you know a lot of people know you, Malik, from BFM. That's a success story. But there, a lot of people don't realize that there have been failures in the past. I think KL classifies as one of them. You 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 know you went to the school of hard knocks, and you you know you had a couple of failures in the past. Can you talk about those? Yeah, and I said, remember, I had a, I told you I had a relatively uh, comfortable childhood. Um, it became extremely uncomfortable. Uh, after my first venture went down uh, during the 1997 Asian financial crisis. Um, that was KL Classified. So basically, it was a classified, um, a classified newspaper, which was to morph into an internet classified you know, um, uh, the, the portal at some point in time, right? But this was 1997. Um, so got, um, I didn't have, we didn't have venture capital in those days. So literally, I borrowed from the bank. Uh, and, and, you know, borrowed 300,000 ringgit uh, to go into this venture. Um, and when Asian financial crisis came, um, classified is all about property, you know, I mean, you know, you know, property guru is going spack now, but it's about property, it's about cars, you know, cars and, uh, you, it's about um, jobs, uh, but none of, them, none of that was uh, going uh, anywhere in 1997. There were no jobs, no, car, no people selling, you know, everyone wanted to sell their cars and property, but no one wanted to buy them. So basically, volume of classifieds went from, you know, uh, if, you, if the index was 100 pre 1990s in crisis, it went down to 15 uh, in post, post crisis. So under that kind of thing, uh, I remember thinking, unfortunately, the timing just absolutely sucked because, you know, the equipment was there, the, we bought the paper, we bought everything, and then crisis struck. What do we do? Do we just, you know, throw the paper away? No, we launch, right? At least give it a shot. We didn't know how long the financial crisis would last. Uh, as it turned out, it lasted a very long time. Uh, so basically, that venture turned out one big zero. Um, you know, um, we uh, I put in three hundred thousand. We raised, I think, about a million ringgit. I put three hundred thousand of my own money, one point five million ringgit. Uh, our revenue was only like eighteen thousand ringgit, right? So no choice. I uh, had to shut it down. And I think that was a time when I really wondered, my gosh, you know, here I am, and uh, you know, uh, just graduated three years ago, four years ago from Harvard, and uh, and basically minus three hundred thousand ringgit down. Um, you know, um, without no property, no thing, no job, right? Um, so that was kind of like, yeah, uh, it, it was a very scary time. Um, and uh, then, you know, the, I, I hid it from my father, was basically on his, 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 he was on his deathbed anyway. Um, so I hid it from him. I didn't worry him about it and all that. But in the inside, I was really, really, you know, quite shook up um, about what I was had to do next. Well, it wasn't the idea, Malik, because um, some years later, remember M Motor Trader, right? Um, started and, and managed by a guy called Sir John Medeski. He also owns Reading Football Club. He actually exited Motor Trader. I think he sold yeah. it for about 100 million ringgit. So that's a lot of money. So it's not because the idea failed, it's the, maybe the execution. So a lot of people have ideas. They think, oh, let's do this, let's do that, right? But ideas is one thing. And ideas is just 0.1% done. You've got to put those ideas into reality, yeah? So it's execution, it's resilience, it's staying the cause, it's all of that. It's a long, long journey. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, completely agree. I mean, you know, I was a rookie, right? I mean, so the mistakes were made. I came from, you know, I went into it uh, from a, as a consultant, earning maybe eighteen thousand ringgit a month, right? And then that's a lot of money, though. Yeah, in those days, and uh, and then doing this entrepreneurship thing. Uh, of course, you know, I, I mean, cost was not 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 part of my makeup at the time it's like okay a rental what's the difference between three dollars and three dollars fifty right um you know 
just okay lah, just say yes to three dollars fifty, right? Uh, what's the cost of paper between you know sort of thirty dollars and you know twenty eight? You know, you just go okay, whatever. Don't don't negotiate so much and all that, right? So so yeah, so there was a lot of sort of um, uh, rookie rookie mistakes. Uh, oh, uh, you know, I'm sure we can distribute these papers just easily, right? Little did I realize that you know the Slango News Vendors Association was like mafia, right? Literally, they are mafia. Yeah, you know? um, they you know they can threaten you. Uh, you know, I, I had to go up in, in a Bollywood movie. I had to almost I had to go to the top table, buy dinner for these guys, go to the top table, and get in you know, and get uh, questions like uh, you know like typical Bollywood movie. Right? I say, okay, um, um, Mutu, tell Mr. Malik here what happens to people who never ask my permission to distribute your paper in in KL. Huh? You tell him what happens to people like that. You know, <laughs> and the Mutu will come. <laughs> Mutu will come and just say, yeah, very, yeah, they uh, cannot say la boss, you know. <laughs> so literally, I'm, I'm in a movie scene, you know. Um, um, so it's, it's really interesting. So really rookie. Um, and, uh, um, but um, yeah, so mistakes were made. And yeah, I met John Modesky. In fact, John Modesky, you know, um, my second meeting with him, uh, he swore, he swore, like, you know, he thumped his fist on the table and just said, you know, if you're going you're to screw me, I'll screw you back. Da, 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 you know, she's being shouted at, like, you know, like, I'm like, what the hell's going on? Oh, you put photos of cars inside your classified paper. Uh, yeah, I was always doing that, but I'm doing the same too. Uh, so, you know, you come across characters like this. Uh, but, but one thing John had, he had, he had cash um, and also he had the experience. Uh, he came to Malaysia with, um, he came to Malaysia already having, uh, you know, just to get away from the publicity of the UK. Uh, he had motor trade in the UK and um, and he wanted to do one in Malaysia. I don't know why Malaysia, but there was. I think Philip Philip Ng uh, enticed him, um, the, his local partner. So yeah. that, um, it's it's you're right. It's completely about you know here was a rookie and here was a seasoned sales guy who who knew the, who knew the market and will bang tables um, with with suppliers etc. Yeah, and then you have this consultant guy. Who's you know trying to be very gentle and diplomatic? Yeah. yeah so 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 there you, there you, so there you are. You know, really wet behind the ears as an entrepreneur. Yep. Um, you're three hundred grand in the hole. You own yep. you own the bank's money. You you owe your shareholders money. You you lost a lot of face. You have no financial capital. You're a Harvard business graduate, and yet you're at the bottom of the, of the rung right now, right? Um, a lot of people people talk about how business success stories. The success story for everyone. There's nine failures, right? So to, to get from, from one of the nine failures to one of the success stories, you got to make it through. Talk about that making it through process. How did you come out of yeah. that hole? I, I was extremely lucky. Um, but to a certain extent, I guess, um, you know, uh, one was that uh, I caught the eye of Mark Chang um, and who Mark and I worked on a few joint projects together. He, he, was, he, was the, he started a jobs portal called Job Street. And um, I used to, I, I approached him and say, Mark, hey, why don't we just put your, you put your jobs into, instead of just online, I'll put it in my paper, right? Uh, I'll put it in my paper because I need content. He said, okay, fine, free, free, free uh, nothing, nothing to lose, right? So that's how I got to know Mark. When, when Mark found out that I, my business was failing, he said, Mark, why don't you join me? Let's join forces. Why don't you join me? Um, and let, let's make something of this, right? I'll make something of Job Street. I said, okay, can. Okay, then he goes, yeah, but I must tell you the salary is only uh, 4,000 ringgit a month, right? I'm like, hey, how am I going to pay my $300,000 debt like this? I'm really sorry. I, I think I, I have to, honestly, I'll, I'll, I'll close shop and I'll go, I'll go, you know, no jobs in Malaysia. I'll go to Singapore, find a professional job if I can to pay, to pay my loans back, right? At least Singapore dollar wasn't tanking at the time. Um, so Mark, two weeks later, Mark said, okay, okay, I'm sorry. I can't offer you more and all that. But two weeks later, um, I got another call from Mark. Mark, um, Malik, um, I have my co-founders... Uh, I talked about, about you to my co-founders. Um, why don't you have, meet him and just just have let's have a just have a chat? Okay, fine. So sat down in a room, and I felt, you know, literally it was like um, it was a weird uh, session because it wasn't about money, it wasn't about you know care classified so much. It was just about me and my philosophy, my life. It kind of almost like this sort of, this sort of conversation. What drives you? Da 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 da. Like, okay, it was really interesting. The questions were going all all all, all over the shop, um, and then. Um, after after the session, they said, "Malik, just give, give give us a few minutes." I said, "Sure." I walked out the room, and then one of them came back out and said, "Hey, Malik, yeah, um, we've talked about it, and um, and I think it'd be, it'd be great for you to join Jobs." I said, "I said, no, I really can, but I can't. I can't on that salary. I need to pay off my loan." And I said, so "Actually, that's what I'm here for. Um, you know, um, how much is your loan?" And this is where I learned honesty is the best policy, right? Uh, because Malua you know, face. So I said, "Oh, two hundred thousand, right?" He says, okay, um, I'll give you a check for $200,000 and uh, you join Job Street. If you 
if you um, if you leave of your own accord, you know you 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 pay it back at some point. Uh, but if we fire you along the way, you don't have to pay it back. So someone took a two hundred thousand dollar bet on me. It should have been three hundred thousand dollar bet, lah, because that was how much I owed. <laughs> but it was a two hundred thousand dollar bet on me. So with with those two, so a week later, that two hundred thousand dollar check came through. I paid off the bank, took a hundred thousand dollar OD, um, and joined Job Street. And that was pretty. Um, that was pretty for Twitters. Not really, I, I. I completely recognize that this doesn't happen to everyone, uh, but it happens. And that per, the person who gave me that check. He's a co-investor in BFM. He's a co-investor in Fire Life today. What do you think he saw in you? Uh, I don't know. I think um, I think the nature of the questions was very much along, along the lines of, is this a guy that we can trust? Is this a guy that is a man of his word? Right. I think those are the nature of the questions. And then and then come the other stuff. Right. Okay. Here we have we are, we are a job street. We are trying. You know, Mark needs help. He's on his own. Uh, he needs he needs someone who can translate his ideas and words into a business plan, into a communication message, and so on. So that's the skills part. Uh, and hey, it doesn't does it, it doesn't you know it is it, it's not a bad thing. He also has a Harvard MBA as well, can attract some venture capital and things like that, right? But I think the fundamental core was well, can can we trust this guy, or is he just you know, or is he, is he just a fly by night? You know, you know, yeah, he was lucky enough to get the MBA, do his MBA here, but but at the end of the day. You know, he's a you know he's a fly by night kind of guy, right? So I think that was the fundamental thing: the trust, and that trust uh, continued until today, right? So Kayip, uh, this uh, particular individual co-founder, on Kayip, uh, he we've been co-investing together uh, ever since then. So, you think? Do you think uh, Kayip and Mark are typical investors? Because the typical investor would look for I don't. This is an assumption. Right? They they would look for growth over um, and everything else. It would trump everything else, right? But in this respect, it seems to me that they, you know, they prioritize trust uh, over maybe growth capital. And and is this something that you know is that an anomaly in in the investment world, or is it the normalcy in the investment world? I, I think there's a um, they're not quite the right frame of references, right? I mean, you know, um, they're not obviously looking to me as growth capital because I'm I'm not a source of capital. Right? They look at me as a con- useful contributor to to Job Street as an employee slash uh uh you know employee slash uh, management right so in that sense trust is important that 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 level they're not looking you know trust level of course when they go for uh venture capital they go for uh they go for money they go for you know sort of um you know who the valuations and stuff like that, of course um and relationships as well of course that has to do with it but to me it was definitely about you know can you trust this person to help mark uh run the company grow the company um yeah so but you know, hey, all of us again. As as there, as there are many entrepreneurs and many investors with different stripes as well. Um, you have some who are a bit more, you know, what we call it, uh, spray and pray, right? Uh, a little bit like that, spray and pray. Some are very targeted. Some are more like, you know, like uh, like uh, Mark. Mark is so uh, so tough on his entrepreneurs or on 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 his in, uh, his investment. I don't think he's made. Um, he has Job Street, um, uh, Jobs JCB Next, I think, uh, as a as a listed company, uh, and that company hasn't really invested in anything in the last ten to fifteen years. So he Mark's criteria is way stringent, right? Cape's less stringent, uh, and mine, I'm I'm all over the shop, right? Sometimes I'm 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 you know I'm 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 completely uh, bedazzled by an entrepreneur that I'll say you know what whatever you, whatever you do I'll, I'll I'm investing in you. Uh, but there are times when I'm a bit more hard on them, where you know I need to see some, you know, I need to see uh, a, a minimum viable product first, or I need to see some cash coming in first uh, before before I invest. It all depends on the mix. Yeah. So as a funder of ideas, and of course, different investors have different motivations, and they're they, they're different personalities, right? But are there commonalities between you know a, a general trend of investors, what they look for? Um, you talk about trust being important. Yes. What else do they look for? The one or two, two or three X factor things that they look for. Um, I, I I think for sure it's the entrepreneur, um, uh, the team around the entrepreneur, um, and you know, sort of early. You know, I I really what they want to know. What what we want to know is whether are your head in this are your head in the clouds or do you really know this stuff, right? Um, have you actually talked to customers before? Yeah? Um, and 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 see where this where this takes you. So. I think it's just that you know the, it's a, a little bit intuitive. Um, you know, uh, can this at the end of the day you, you? But fundamentally, it's the person in front of you, right? If you uh, think that this person has 
uh, a bit of the execution, uh, the execution skills, uh, you know, um, partic particularly execution skills, because I just had a dime a dozen, right? Dime a dozen. Do, does this person know, know, you know have the execution um, skills? And does he know what he's talking about? Uh, has that you, does he know uh, as you peel the onion, he doesn't just know the first layer, but he knows the third and fourth layer, then it's, then it's, uh, then it's great. Uh, give you an example. I was um, uh, Eric Cheng, um, Carson. Um, you know, I mean, I'm a classified guy, right? I, I know about cars, buy, sell, buy, sell. You put up portal, you, you match buyers and sellers, right? But Eric went further, right? He peeled the onion. He kind of like said, you know what? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a certain quality element. I'm going to have inspection. I'm going to have this. I'm going to have that. I'm like, holy cow. I never thought of that when I was a classifieds guy. All I wanted to do was just match buyers and sellers, right? But this guy, Eric, goes on and just does a lot of things. It resolves all the problems that, that people worry. They worry about getting a dud car, right? That's the worry, right? And so he resolves that worry by saying, okay, I'll inspect it for you. So it, it is, it, 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 I can guarantee you it's not a dud car. Fantastic. He solved a huge problem, right? Which... To me, that he peeled, he peeled the fourth layer that I never got to, right? Yeah, that's right. And that's part of the reason why he is now Malaysia's first uh, unicorn, right? He's just got valued at, well, 1.7 billion US dollars. Um, there's a question, actually, which is interesting, we should have asked, I should have asked about 10 minutes ago. Um, because a lot of people um, started the way you, way you did, right, Malik? Um, they started with a job in the corporate world. And then, of course, nobody wants to work for as an employee for the rest of their lives. They want to go and, you know, build on their dreams and come, come, come along with that. A lot of them don't have the courage, though. How did you build up the courage to do that? Especially since you say you came from a comfortable middle class background. I realize we're... Yeah, um, it's, you know, I think, yeah, it's, it's one of those... Uh, Honestly, I didn't think too much about it. Um, you know, I, I was so confident of myself in my first venture and all that, right? Uh, that that it doesn't, you just dive, you just dive for it. Um, but you're right, I didn't have kids then. Um, you know, um, it would have been a lot harder if uh, I had, you know, school going children. Um, so at different stages of your life, you need to play it differently, right? So I think when you have a young family and all that, I think you have to you, uh, you have to de-risk right uh, completely. I, I'm not sure whether you you know in that sense you would say for example if I were uh, if I had family, young children, and so on, I would say you know what I will go I will I will not start my own thing where I you know it's from scratch. I'm trying a, a very early stage company. I would join Casa, right? They're growing and all. I would join Casa and then maybe I can get some options and build build myself from there, right? So when, when I have, you know, you don't need to start, start something from scratch. If you, you know, there, there's all this element of de-risking. Sure, if you're comfortable, you have a big pile of savings, start something with yourself for sure. Your kids are school going age or you don't have no kids, go for it, right? Um, but I think at all, that's all stages level of life. You just need to just figure out, uh, you know, what can you afford to lose, right? What can you, uh, you know, if, if you can't afford to lose a single thing, then don't. But if you can say, you know what, actually, I can do my, the, the, you know, I can at least get a taste of the entrepreneur environment by joining, uh, 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 by joining Grab, by joining, you know, uh, Big Pay, by joining someone, you know, uh, CITOS, go for it, right? Because then it build up your experience from there. And then, you know, and, and hopefully in an area that you really like, right? So if you're really interested in credit scoring and things like that, yeah, jo join CITOS. Uh, you're interested in you know consumer marketing and and, and e wallets and pay go for grab right kind, kind of thing. So I think there are sort of it's not a um, it's not a digital one zero answer. It's about sort of you know making sure that the things that you go into is a stepping stone for future entrepreneurship, uh, but also it suits your lifestyle for sure. If you don't have any kids, you don't have any you don't have any spouses, or, or your spouse is working even better, they, you know your spouse can you know give you know bring in the bring in the bring home the bacon so to speak. And you go out and do the option value stuff. That's that's the ideal scenario, uh, but no, no no life is ideal, right? So yeah, yeah. And of course, um, everybody knows that the life of an entrepreneur is a lonely one. It's a painful one, and you give up a lot of stuff. You sacrifice everything, right? Because you're trying to make it happen. Um, you sacrifice your social life. You sacrifice your family life. Um, talk about the challenges that you went through as an entrepreneur. Did you did you have to sacrifice? And you know what what did you lose along the way, Malay? Um, so I, I knew, for example, starting VFM was not easy. Um, I had young, young children um, and I was, my family was in Singapore and I went back to Malaysia to start VFM, right? 
Um, so I'm still feeling the, in a way, the reverberations of that um, till today, to a certain extent, right? There is some resentment, the fact that I wasn't around uh, during uh, to, you know, to, I was, yeah, I was home every weekend for sure, but there's still some resentment. I wasn't there during weekdays to help out with the kids, help out with that. I was in KL and you know, being in business. So there are some, um, there are some family sacrifices and some, some, and some resentment that you have to deal with, right? Um, depending on your family circumstances and all that, right? you might have a completely understanding uh, family, but most families are, you know, yeah, they'll take it for a while, but not, not, not the whole way, right? Um, you know, Chong, you have, you know, you, you have your family too, you know, you know, you know where that comes from, right? So, yeah. so I think, um, yeah, there are sacrifices. I wouldn't say that mine is especially crazy. It's not. I think it's just one of those things. Um, there are some who have gone through even worse. Um, and uh, but the good news is, is that entrepreneurship is not as lonely as it was before. Uh, right now, I'm on a WhatsApp group with 250 entrepreneurs, right? And and it is a running conversation. And if you want to seek out people, you can seek out people. Um, so all I'm saying is that today, is, to a certain extent, it's less lonely than before. Uh, before, you didn't have internet or you didn't have even a WhatsApp group or chat group, etc. You don't know who to, who to turn to, right? Um, you kind of like... Um, you you pick up the phone and you kind of like okay have an introduction to that person you pick up another phone and call that person call that person it's a lot harder now you just put it one message on a WhatsApp group or on, or, or, a, or a post on your social media page and people say hey I know you know and, and so on so it's not as lonely as it was before so in a sense I I I see it as, as a fantastic thing um, the communications are getting uh, speedier faster uh, and and you know I, I can't imagine myself. I, I'm sometimes talking to 20 somethings and 30 somethings. And I remember, you know, if I were 20 something and 30 something, can I talk to that person? That's why I went to Harvard Business School for this, so that you can have those kind of connections, right? <laughs> but but today you, you don't need those kind of connections anymore, right? Because your 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 network can be so so far can be so wide so quickly. Yeah. Um some some people might say that now is, is a golden period for entrepreneurialism because there's so much money in the system, there's so much assistance in the system, there's so much interest in ASEAN. There's so much interest in, in Asia. And of course, Malaysia has never been more screwed up, right? So there's so many opportunities around as well. I say that with yeah. a pinch of salt, by the way. Um, you know, so, so, so if you were talking to a bunch, and you, you, you talk to um, entrepreneurs all the time now, right? Um, what would be a template for success if there's ever such a thing? Uh, um, sorry, uh, can't answer that one. <laughs> No, but I think, you know, um, it's, there's no time, I mean, you know, the grittiness, the, the belief in what you're doing, for sure, um, you know, um, making sure that, you know, you understand the, where the money is coming from, how you generate the money, that's for sure, because no business survives with money. I would say even that for social entrepreneurship, um, you need to know how to generate the money for even social entrepreneurship. Um, if you don't know how to generate that money, then don't start. Um, so, you know, uh, but definitely the grittiness, the resilience and, you know, uh, the ability to, um, you know, sort of having a passion for it so that when times are tough, you know, you know, you can go back to your core and say, I'm doing this for a certain reason, right? Um, and and you, you can rely on that because if you're just doing it for money and money's not coming in, you'll drop the, you drop the business very, very quickly. Um, so. And then also knowing when, when to call it quits, I would say, you know, um, there is also a time when, you know, you are in, and this is the part where it's a really uh, interesting uh, thing is that, you know, if things are not working out and really are not working out, can you step outside, can you stop outside and look in and just say, you know what, am I, am I, am I doing this right? Am I in the wrong business? Am I this? And being objectively to be able to accept criticism or accept the fact that, you know what, this business is a, is a, is a, is, is a dog business. I, 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 you know, I, I I entered it wrong. I mean, it was wrong for me to enter it. Now I've now that I've learned, now I've peeled the onion. I realize that it's not a, it's not even a pot of gold over there. I can't even find I can't even find bronze in there. Right? So and then then it's time to step out. Yeah, it's easier said than done, Malay, right? Because if you spend the last twenty years or ten years of your life building this baby, and then that baby is you know kind of grown up, mal malformed or, or malfunctioning, how do you say goodbye to it? You know, I mean, I'm I'm sure yeah. you talked to a lot of these. Um, you know, for, for every 250 entrepreneurs you talk to, there must be a, a quantum of them that don't succeed. Yeah. Um, so the question is whether you, you fast, um, you know, whether you fail, um, whether you can recognize failure and then not fail fast, but know when to draw the line, right? 
Um, I, I don't like entrepreneurs who are like, oh, after one setback, fail, you know, and then start another business, start another business every year, right? That's not right because you haven't given your first business a good shot. Uh, but for those who have given a good shot, given it five, six years and can't, can't make it work, right? Then I think it's fair to say, you know what, now I'm going to draw the line here and, and you know, sort of, um, and live to fight again, right? Um, so that's, that's important. Um, you need to live to fight again. Um, interesting question from Carmen Chuang, um, you know, I think from uh, Sydney Cake House, um, asking, dear Malay, good day, how do you actually keep your positive attitude and how do you juggle your family and, and work? You know, I, in fact, that's true. You, you're, you're most of the time I see you and you're up, Malay, you're positive, you're laughing, you're joking, you're driven, you're energetic. How do you keep that going? Um, I don't know. It's, it's you guys, right? Um, it's the guys at BFM and the guys at Fire Life and all that. I mean, I, I draw energy from being part of a part of a part of a team. Um, that's that's only that's only the thing. Um, if I can't, if if I'm not drawing energy out of them because you know everyone's very moody and things like that, then then something's wrong. Then I'm then I'm doing something wrong. I've been in companies like that. Uh, I must say, of which I'm a director of, but I'm not I'm not executive director, right? I sit down in a management meeting. And everyone's just so like, so down and, you know, no one laughs. I crack a joke and everyone just like look at each other as to whether they ought to laugh or not, right? And, and I, I, give the, I give the founder a hard time. I just say, you know, look, what are you, what's happening here, right? And look at your face when you talk to your employees. Your face is like, you know, like you scold them all the time, right? And I have a hard, you know, and some, but this, he, this person's wired that way, right? And, until, and then after a while, I'm like, you know, uh, you know he, he, he can't get, he can't get a number two, he can't get, you know, uh, things. So uh, he can't get a reliable team and, you know, his team, you know, so I'm like, well, you know, at the end of the day, that's our fault, isn't it, as founders, right? Um, if we can't, if we are, we are responsible to create, for, to create that energy, the atmosphere, and then we can draw energy from that, right, ourselves. But we need to be the instigator of it. We need to be the creator of that. Yeah. Um, another question here, actually, from the floor, Malik, and this is interesting because it seems like a, quite a, um, well, um, it seems like a, quite a disturbing question initially because, you know, people assume that passion and purpose is in all of us, right? But we, we are living in troubled times now. This is probably the hardest time in at least 100 years. So there's a lot of people now who are going through um, issues professionally, personally. This question anonymously, right? What's your advice on finding passion and purpose in life? And it's not as, you know, it may not be as... as the question that you think it is initially. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I don't know. I, I've always, um, I, I can only show by, I guess, in a way, uh, anecdotes and examples and so on, right? Um, I know um, I know. since day one, I always, even my Harvard M MBA's uh, uh, answers, right? The, 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 the answers that got me, the essays I wrote to get me into, uh, to the business school was about Malaysia. Right, it was about contributing to Malaysia. Um, I remember my best essays were about that. And it came from the heart because I really want to contribute. Um, to a large extent, I've not been allowed to contribute um, because, you know, politicians don't like you to enter the turf, right? Um, so it's very hard to contribute. Um, but hey, then I started my own entrepreneurship thing to contribute, right? So I started a radio station that focused on you know, on business at least, at least I can contribute to making Malaysia's, uh, Malaysia's uh, economy competitive. I can contribute towards giving knowledge about business and the world and how people compete in business to Malaysians. So I did it my way, right? Meaning, yeah, this is my contribution. Sure, the, the um, official, uh, the official, the, the, the policymakers do not want me to contribute, but I'm going to force, in, uh, force myself onto you anyway. <laughs> by having this radio station. Um, and likewise, I'm forcing myself to contribute to the education system by having Idris Jala on, having uh, Lee Kai on, and getting and rallying the troops around, pressurizing whoever the you know, current education minister is to kind of like, look, he, let's, let's do this. You know, don't, don't worry about it. We got it. You, know, you, just, you just have to let us, allow us to, to do our thing. Um, so yeah, about finding it, I don't know. I, I, there, are, there are things that you find yourself coming back to again and again. Um, and to me, it's, uh, it's definitely Malaysia. Um, um, and my way of contributing to Malaysia is education. Um, I've rationalized it now. I think you know, when I started BFM is about education. Starting Fire Life is about uh, financial education of Malaysians, right? 
Um, and now, uh, and on in, in in my other sort of hobby is also on the directly on the education system in Malaysia. So um, so to me, I found that I don't know how I found it, but I just found that um, maybe it's because of my education. Maybe I. I enjoyed it so much. My education life has been absolutely fantastic. I've, I've, I've been privileged to have fantastic teachers. I've been privileged to have uh, fantastic um, schools, attend fantastic schools and the best universities in the world. Um, it has never been, I've never, except for one minor spe spell in England where I felt you know, in two years in Charter House where I thought it was just the most horrible thing that happened to me. Uh, other than that, it was like, you know, it was fantastic, you know, um, had a most, uh, you know, and, and to me, why, why, you know, why can't, you know, every Malaysian have that sort of experience, not necessarily from you know, the resources point of view and all that, but at least from this, in the spirit of great teachers uh, and great mentors uh, from your teachers and, and, and so on. Why not, why not? Let's have that for every single Malaysian. And that's how I found yeah. my passion. Yeah, what you said, Malik, about um, you wanting to help the country, but the politicians didn't want you to help the country, it seems like a huge uh, miss on the country's part. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs feel that because they feel that if, you know, they've been left out of the whole system because they're not part of the, you know, the connected few, right? Um, Malaysia is in a very tough place right now. And, and we know without going into, de into details how bad it, it is and how, um, how pessimistic a lot of Malaysians are. What advice would you give people? I mean, because you have got the benefit of distance from Malaysia right now. Yeah, um, I, 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 I think we always have to kind of like sort of, we have to assume, to, to, to me, I have to assume in a way uh, the worst, I know, we have to assume that the government won't help, right? I start on that basis. Um, so uh, I'll give you an example where, where if government helped me one bit, can create FDI of $5 billion in Malaysia, in two years, right? This is an example of how crazy things are. Allow us, allow BFM to beam out from Johor, right? Why? Because from Johor, we can beam into Singapore. And why Singapore? Because all the regional decision makers of MNCs are in Johor, are in Singapore, right? Allow us to beam. And just, you asked me just now about Singapore English, huh? I laughed and joked about it. I tell you, they hear BFM English and they'll be like, holy cow. Are those Malaysians, right? And are those Malaysians talking sensibly about economy and industry? Because what we're seeing in media are all these politicians talking rubbish, but suddenly we hear the real Malaysians talking about talking about business, right? Allow me to do that. Give me a frequency from one of your government stations that do not do anything in Singapore anyway, right? Allow me to do that and beam into Singapore, right? And let me get at least some complimentary FDI from there to bring to Malaysia, right? I put this proposal up to MCMC. It just goes on deaf ears. You know, no one wants to. No one wants to go have the guts to say, "Hey, RTM, I'm sorry. I'm gonna take one of your stations and give it to, uh, one of your frequencies, or even your station, and give it to in Johor because it means it means five billion dollars, maybe more, in FDI to Malaysia. Do we get help with that? It's not even for me, you know. <laughs> it's not even for BFM. It's for the country. This is what I mean by trying to contribute. And just you know, and it's free. It costs the, the 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 country zero. All it costs is a frequency for me to beam into from Johor into Singapore, and you get five billion FDI. Azmin Ali will be like running to the bank. Do we get it? No. Well, it's fear, then isn't before, it? Yeah, fear of what? <laughs> fear of what? What we 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 infect Johorians with business philosophies and you know markets and economy and so on. Really, you know. I mean, you know, I can understand if Singapore fears it, but they won't. Singapore would be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Malaysia, Malaysia, yeah, please do take all the labor intensive stuff or maybe, you know, stuff that we don't want to do. Yeah, go, go talk to our multi multinationals about that, right? Uh, we want the we want the AI stuff. We want the, you know, sort of, um, we want the vac vaccine manufacturers, right? But yeah, Malaysia gets everything else. Why not, right? So these are the kind of things which I, which I to me, it's I just absolutely... Uh, I'm flabbergasted as like, you know, and before, and sometimes we, you know, we see a new minister coming in and we start preparing ourselves for, for, for like, okay, presenting to them, you know, getting appointments. By the time you get appointments now, it's like, oh, new minister. Okay, here we go again. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. That is why so, some philosophers say that one of the first casualties of, of war and oppression is the truth. And the truth is what uh, a lot of Malaysians don't get. 
Um, there's a reason why Grab, you know, headquartered in Singapore, Malay. There's there's a reason why Kasim's Eric Eric Cheng is being asked whether he's going to move down south or to Australia or to list in America, and what have you, right? You've also got companies like Aerodyne. You know, these these are big guys coming through. Is Malaysia the right place to be in, though, as an entrepreneur? You know, Malay. Um, right. I think that um, uh, right. I mean, at the end of the day, as entrepreneurs, you will choose whoever will value your company the highest, right? So if it if all else being equal, if if Singapore gives the same valuation as Malaysia, right? Uh, the stock markets give the same valuation, etc. That kind of thing. One would choose your home country, right? But if there are other factors, meaning there are this 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 you know um, swathes of capital. Um, you know, floating around in the US and things like that. For sure, you know, you make a you make a rational decision of getting the highest highest valuation wherever. To me, that's not really the. I, I hear you guys talk about oh yeah, people going less in Singapore, things like that. I, to, to me, those those kind of conversations are like, okay, fine. You know, um, we list somewhere else. But at the end of the day, where is the spirit, right? Where where do you employ people? That to me is the most important thing. Where uh, where is the place that you will put your headquarters, your the people with your brains of your organization, where is it going to be, right? If that answer is Malaysia, I think that's that's good enough. I don't care about financial capital. Anyway, those financial capital guys can pay as much for my company as much as possible, but I want the brains to emanate from Malaysia. I want people that I would want to come to Malaysia, even if they're not Malaysians, coming from overseas, because hey, Malaysia is a great environment. You know what? Wow, oh, Malaysia. You know, you go in there. There are, you know, there's, 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 there are, you not just have the city, but the f- infrastructure is good. But you also have the outdoors. We can go cycling in the weekends and things like that. This is what we want. We want the brains and the talent to come to Malaysia. I don't care about the financial capital. I can list anywhere, but you want the you want the people to grow and develop in Malaysia, right? So if we can say yes to that, and I think that's what that's why I'm working on the education system because if we fix that. We'll get the brains in Malaysia, even from overseas. It, honestly, to me right now, I'll be looking at some uh, Afghan, Af- Af- Afghanistan and saying, hey, are there, is there any talent we can poach from there to bring to Malaysia? Right? What's wrong with that? Right? Instead of Absolutely. going to yeah. MMM2H, right? I, you know, um, why are we, you know, is there any you know, children of MMM2H residents, right? Hey, are any of you guys, you know, interested in setting up business in Malaysia? You know, uh, help, you know I would be looking at those kinds of, we had a bunch of Bosnians coming over, right? After during during the Bots, um, Bosnia Herzegovina wars and and so on, right? Um, but these are these you know I, and I, I know developers from um, from Syria in Malaysia, right? Because they're escaping Syria, so why not, right? You know, if if we can be um, if we can be a, a, a talent place, at least you know. You know you know, you don't have to get everyone, maybe it's not AI, maybe it's not this, but maybe it's maybe development, maybe software, maybe uh, you know, a bit of machine learning, etc. No problem, right? So that's, I think, to me, that is the core thing. It's not so much where you get your capital, it's where your, your, where your brain and your, the heart and soul of your organization is. Okay, Malik, time check. We've got about five to ten minutes left. So, um, you know, like it or not, you become a role model for a lot of people uh, in Malaysia, thanks to your business in BFM. And what have you? So you know, people people listen to you, right? And and they take heed of what you're saying. So beyond the business principles, let's talk about some ethos in your in your life, right? What's your approach to investment, um, financial capital? What's your advice on that front? In short, in short, be an owner of financial capital, right? Uh, work for companies who will involve you and who will help you become owners of financial financial capital, right? Uh, meaning, you know. Don't work for companies that just gives you a salary. Work for a company, a good company that also gives you stock options. That's um, you know, so you can be you you can participate in that in that thing. If if you have you know, if you work for a company that that, that thinks that you only you only need you know, just give you a salary and that's it, then you'll always be you'll always be a a, a, a labor an owner of labor and not an owner of financial capital, right? Okay. What about the role of other things like? Uh, okay, you you're about to say something as well. You know, and I say, if, if, if you're not working for a company like that, make your way towards becoming owners of financial capital, right? Start investing, right? Um, you know, out of, you know, the 5,000 ringgit that you get, take 10% aside uh, out front, that 500 ringgit, take that 500 ringgit, invest it. If you don't know how to invest it, just put it in, in one of the robo-advisors for, for the time being, right? Just learn, read. The moment you put some money in it, you start to learn and, 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 and you start to be, t- pay attention. Um, so all I'm saying is that you got to make your way, even though you, you know if you're working for, uh, for working for companies that are not allowing not not part of that, do it yourself. Um, you know, do that because you know what, this sadly that's the way the world is. But you know, if you become a good investor, I think you're okay. Then you become you know um, over time that 
will grow and grow, it will, it will compound. And one day you can just stick a middle finger up to any any company that you don't like to work for, right? And you just work for you just work for a company that you really truly love working for. Yeah, that's called having screw you money, right? Um, so what are the sacrifices that you have to go through to get that screw you money? Um, do you buy the BMW or do you not buy that BMW? You know, do you go on that holiday to London or do you not go on the holiday to London? As I said, if you, you know, if you, I mean, you know, if you put your first, you know, 10% or first 20% of your salary into something, then you can do whatever else with the balance, right? It's up to you. I mean, you can, you can, have, you can buy your BMW if you want. I wouldn't advise it. You know, grabs, I, I, you know, grabs is fine, um, you know, uh, but, but yeah, but if you put, if you consistently put that 10, 20% away first and then, and then spend the rest, that's, that's totally up to you. And what about relationships? What's your view of relationships? Oh, no, in the not. entrepreneurial journey, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, really hard to say that one. Uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's something. It's it's very individual as well, right? Um, everyone has their own um, and things like that. I think uh, it's always keep your spouse in the loop. I think that's really important. Um, you know, um, and not whatever the. I mean, I, sometimes I I must admit I didn't because the it's just the the dynamics is such that. You know, when 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 I bring, you know, when I when I if I were to really say to my wife that uh, actually we were three hundred thousand dollars in the hole, <laughs> I mean, it, I mean, it would have gone completely. You know, um, you know, I, I, I would have been fighting a war on two fronts, right? Uh, you know, sort of, you know, just not just bankers, but also, you know, trying to contain the things. So, so sometimes, you know, you do make. Um, uh, I I I I break my own rule of keeping your spouse in the loop, right? So, but you know, being the male thing lah, trying to trying to protect. But in the end, you, you know, the egg falls on your face all the time, right? So yeah, that's right. Okay, okay. One face. one question before we pass it back to Ruzi and she's waiting in the wings, right? Yeah. What does the fifty year old Malay tell twenty five year old Malay, and what does that wisdom inform? How does that inform the seventy five year old Malay? Oh, okay. Wow, that's uh, that's a bit of a time loop. But I can see what the fifty-five-year-old says to the twenty-five-year-old, uh, which is to say, "Hey, you know what? Um, uh, spend a little time um, really doing. Don't don't run away from the hard skills uh, that you need to do." I, I ran away from one particular skill at BCG. I was at BCG. Um, I the next step for me was to be the interface with the client. We call it a client manager, or you know, and so on. I ran away from that because I'm like, you know what? Oh my gosh, I have to manage clients. I have to, I have to, um, I have to do, you know, I have to manage all the expectations and this and that and so on. Basically, you have to, you have to be an account manager. You have to sell. It's a hard, it's a hard role. Um, and usually, unless you want to become a partner, you you really don't want to do it, right? Because there's a lot of grief. But actually, that grief is good because you know why? Uh, because I didn't do it, I had to do it on my own money uh, rather than doing it on BCG money. BCG money was, you know, twenty k a month. On my own money, it was negative negative ten k a month, right? So. So you know, don't don't run away from the hard skills. So you know, I I know I notice a lot of hires that we have sometimes. Um, you can tell they're running away from something, right? Some the moment a huge hard problem comes or a hard job comes, they run away, jump jobs, and come to you. I'm like, you know what? Actually, um, you know, you want to work here? Yeah, you got to you you got to you got to you got to promise me you got to do the hard stuff too, right? Because otherwise you won't learn. But it's uh, always amazing. Year old, 75 year old, uh, hey, you know, um, from the 55 year old to the 75 year old, I would say, uh, hey, don't leave it till 75 before you kind of like, you know, sort of um, enjoy yourself and, uh, you know, learn from the COVID-19, how you're working remotely, etc. So, you know, travel and work at the same time if you want, if you don't want to work, no problem. But, you know, always um, uh, that passion, don't, 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 don't give up on it, right? Even to the 75 year old, education will still be there. Yeah, and of course, seventy-five is still twenty years younger than the ninety-five-year-old man that ran the country uh, for some time. Malay, it was it's always amazing, ready to talk to you. I'm always intrigued and entertained by your uh, infinite wisdom. And thank you for for talking to everybody on the panel this this afternoon. Thank you again, Malay. Back to Rosie. Well, looks like we are at the end of our discussion today. I would like to thank Malik and Chuang for the uh, inspiring, sincere thoughts and insightful conversation. I would also like to thank all the participants for your enthusiasm and warm engagement and support. We hope this session has opened our minds to achieve greater heights and challenge our limits. I wish you safe and comfortable stay at home experience and we look forward to seeing you at many more thought series to come. Thank you. <laughs>